Welcome everybody to the um, 2023 spring, although it feels like summer, salon. Um, thank you for choosing to spend this beautiful evening with us uh, in Ekkekstan, our, our salon home now for, we're starting our ninth year. Uh, we started in April 2015 and uh, we've presented three authors uh, every quarter. Without, well, I was gonna say without fail. One fail, but it wasn't a fail because it was April 2020. But, um, but then we picked up in July. We did it online for two years and um, then we came back in person. And so thank you uh, for coming to join us. And I want to thank the wonderful Emily and Kickstand Cafe for hosting us all these years. Um, Today we will have Ben Berman, Charles Coe, and you know, I never asked you if that is the correct pronunciation of your name, and I apologize for that. Charles Coe. Just call me Nancy. Nancy. Um, and uh, Kathy Desjardins. So with a little asterisk next to her name, and I'll explain why. For a night of poetry, April is uh, National Poetry Month, and I think every month should be National Poetry Month, but apparently we have to share with other things. So for the moment, it's April. Uh, so, as many of you know, the Arlington, I'm Anjali Mitterduva, um, and uh, the Arlington Author Salon is a free reading series with a twist. Each author's presentation includes a sensory experience to complement their reading. Um, sometimes we've had music, sometimes we've had photos, tasty treats, fabrics, sculpture, smells. When we were online, there was somewhat reduced repertoire, but still, our, our authors managed to surprise us. Um, the Author Salon takes place quarterly, uh, the first week of January, April, July, and October, except sometimes we move it a bit to circumvent, circumvent holidays, which means that our next one is going to be July 13th, so that we're not too close to the July 4th holiday. So mark your calendars. Uh, each author will have 15 minutes to read. Uh, and we'll have a combined Q&A at the end. So uh, if you can possibly hold your questions for the end. Um, and then we'll bring all the, the authors up here to answer questions. Um, so in addition to uh, thanking Emily and the staff of Kickstand, uh, I want to give a shout out to our salon co-organizer, Whitney, who unfortunately, Whitney Scherer, also an Arlington author, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. Um, huge thanks to the Robbins Library and Sarah Regan and the staff um, who helped run the salon. Um, ACMI for providing video and posting uh, the edited video afterwards. The program is funded in part by the Arlington Libraries Foundation. I don't know if you all know of the existence of this, uh, of this group. It's dedicated to helping open the doors to all who are curious. Uh, creating an inclusive space for our Arlington community and ensuring the library's future as the cornerstone of the community for generations to come. Uh, so they support the Robbins and Fox branch of the libraries and they work to create a place where readers and resources connect. Um, they also, the Arlington Library Founda Libraries Foundation raises funds to bridge the gap between assets and aspirations. Uh, in order to maintain a world-class library, which we have right down the street. Uh, they help support current programs like ours and launch new initiatives. And the foundation believes that libraries are more than physical spaces to find books, uh, but they're windows into adventure and innovation and creativity and community and opportunity. They strive to make that possible by investing in the libraries that we love. So you can learn more about the Arlington Libraries Foundation at ArlingtonLibrariesFoundation.org. Uh, we have Mike Bulio here from the Mike from the book rack. Uh, please consider buying books to support not only the bookseller but also our authors. Uh, and I just uh, before we launch into the 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 real programming tonight, I want to let you know of a new great writing organization in town co-organized by Whitney Sharer called the Blaze Writers Project. I don't know if some of you know about it. Um, they just launched, they've had, uh, they have a fun event for writers coming up on May 3rd called Blazorama. And it's basically a writing party, which may sound like an oxymoron, but it's not. Um, it's a super productive evening in a bar. And the evening features a craft talk of a local author, Louise Miller, as well as an hour of super generative writing time. 
uh, a drink and appetizers included in the ticket. And honestly, just a really great chance to have fun with a ton of other local writers. And by writers, this is anybody who chooses to take some time to write in, on some device, on some paper. You don't have to be a published author. You don't have to even have written before. But you, as long as you feel moved to write. Um, so I highly recommend it. And uh, it takes place in Belmont Center at uh, Trinktisch. And you can get your tickets at blazewritersproject.com. If you forget the name, come see me at the end. Um, so I, I recommend signing up. That's May 3rd. OK, so um, the little asterisk is that, unfortunately, Kathy Desjardins couldn't make it today because she is under the weather um, and not a weather that she wanted to share with all of us. So, uh, But she wants to share her work. And so we're super happy to have somebody here who will read some of her poetry so that we can still imagine that she is here at the salon with us. Our first author is going to be Ben Berman. Where is Ben? Ben Berman. Um, and so I'm going to introduce each uh, the author, and then they'll come up and, and do their thing, which I don't know what their thing will be yet, so I'll be surprised as well. Uh, ben is returning as a salon alum. I don't remember when you were here. It was some years ago. Uh, he's the author of three books of poems and the new book of essays called Writing While Parenting, which some of us manage to do. It takes a long time. Um, he has won the Peace Corps Award for the best book of poetry. Uh, he's twice been shortlisted for the Massachusetts Book Awards. Uh, and he's received awards from the Mass Cultural Council, the New England Poetry Club, and Somerville Arts Council. He's been teaching for over 20 years. He currently lives and teaches creative writing classes at Brookline, Brookline High School. Um, he lives in the area with his wife and two daughters. So everybody, please welcome Ben. Thank you so much, Anjali. It is such a pleasure to be here. And thank you to Sarah and the Robbins Library and the Kickstand Cafe. Charles, it is such a pleasure to read with you. And Lisa, thanks for coming, too. Um, I'm going to read a few uh, essays from a new book. It's called Writing While Parenting. It is uh, literary and humorous essays about the overlap between the world of poetry and the world of parenting. And uh, I thought about, for my, my sensory uh, twist, um, uh, my daughter has recently introduced me to a new game called Bean Boozled. Uh, the way that it works is you get two jelly beans, the same color. Uh, one of them is a typical flavor, like cappuccino. And the other one is an atypical flavor, like stinky socks. So you might get uh, tutti frutti, or you might get liver and onions. So uh, they love the game. It was very fun, a good dare. So I thought I would apply that to uh, the reading. I came up with a game. It's called Ben Boozled. And the way that it works is that the book is filled with quotes from, uh, from famous poets. Poets. Uh, but it's also filled with quotes from my young daughters. So I cut out all the quotes and I put them in an envelope and you get to choose one without looking and you get to keep that quote. So you might choose one that says, the real reason for a quest never involves the stated reason. The real reason for a quest is attaining self-knowledge by Thomas Foster. Or you might get one that says, I think your hair is beautiful, like the color of a princess's poop. And that's my five-year-old. And you've been Ben Boozled. So choose one of these. Choose a couple if you'd like. I figured it's kind of like sense of touch and also kind of sense of humor. So the first one I'm going to read is called Narratives Building Blocks. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I really love uh, the chance to be creative. Uh, creativity is sort of my, my happy place when I can just sort of invent and, and play in open-ended ways. Uh, but in many ways, I think of creativity as a destructive force as well, that you oftentimes have to destroy the old narratives in order to build new ones. So I try to dramatize that a little bit with this one, narratives building blocks. My four-year-old is in the living room playing with magnet tiles. She is as focused as I've ever seen her, paying as much attention to shapes as to colors, aesthetics as to structure. 
But I don't have a story until I have two stories, writes Grace Paley, and along comes my two-year-old. It's as though she's just finished watching Donnie Darko and is convinced that destruction, too, is a form of creation. My four-year-old steps in front of her sister, protecting her work, and suggests they engage in parallel play. But my two-year-old is a postmodernist at heart. She fakes left, she jukes right, and then she swipes a square from the bottom of the tower and watches it collapse. There is no center, she shrieks. The center cannot hold. My four-year-old should know by now that our attachment to the impermanent is at the very root of our suffering. That, as Mihai checks it, Mihai says, the important thing is to enjoy the activity for its own sake and to know that what matters is not the result, but the control that one is attaining over their own attention. But she just looks at her once magnificent creation, now lying in a pile of ruins, and starts to cry. I pick my two-year-old up, take her to her room, and tell her that she needs to apologize. Apologize, she says. Apologize for what? For reminding this family that deconstruction, as Derrida points out, is not an operation that supervenes afterwards from the outside, but is always at work in the work? Such is the paradox of progress, she screams from her crib. <laughs> Kill your darlings. <laughs> There's no use trying to reason with the two-year-old, so I pull down the shades, turn off the lights, close the door, and leave. But she refuses to be punished. She begins rattling her baby almost head against the bars of her crib to what sounds like the tune of We Shall Overcome. I go back in there, and I confiscate all of her dolls. I want her to understand that vulnerability is at the heart of creativity. I want her to acknowledge how much courage it takes to create something from nothing. But she is adamant now that true courage comes from knowing that our creations are always on the verge of collapse. I try to convince her that she is suffering from massive cognitive distortions, but she is long past listening to me. She believes in the transformative powers of art, and she has transformed her crib into a trampoline. She's jumping wildly now, master of her own private mosh pit, lost in that ecstatic lightness of being. <laughs> um, this next one is called, What to Expect When You Are Expectorating. <laughs> My five-year-old, oh, I should say too, uh, the book was written over a period of five years. It starts when my daughters are one and three and travels them up until they're, they're six and eight. So they're different ages. I don't want you to think I have a dozen kids. So <laughs> this is when my daughter is five. My five-year-old is into spitting these days. Not the nasty huckaloogie over a rail kind of spitting, but the motorboating your lips and spray saliva all over the place kind of spitting. I find the whole thing kind of funny until she hoses me in the face for saying no to potato chips for breakfast. Then I sit her down and explain that big kids use words when they're upset and that spitting on someone else is never, ever okay. But Papa, she says, that's my thing. <laughs> I want to explain to her that five-year-olds are too young to have things. That at best, they have phases with any luck they quickly grow out of. But there is something so strikingly unapologetic about her defense, as though spitting is her way of speaking her truth, that the writer in me suddenly wants a thing of my own. After all, writers have always been celebrated for defying the conventional rules and trusting their own visions. E.E. E. Cummings capitalizing on his refusal to capitalize. Dickinson transforming her dashed literary dreams into a rage of dashes. And now that we've entered the digital age, you need more than verbal precision and a heightened awareness of ambiguity to make it as a poet. It's all about building a brand and going viral, about transforming your thing into a style. However, as soon as I start imagining what my thing might be, I immediately find myself getting overwhelmed, 
worrying that I might not have a thing or that the things that I do have aren't actually that interesting. Maybe I'm just feeling defensive, but I start to wonder if it would be reductive to only allow ourselves a single thing. After all, the purpose of poetry, writes Shesla Milosh, is to remind us how difficult it is to remain just one person. What if I had a plethora of things, I think to myself, and start making a list of all the various vices that I'd like to be able to get away with? And yet, to be a poet is to write with the ear. And the critic, that's my thing, sounds so much better than the Coriam, those are my things. Or the perfectly iambic, my things are in a constant state of flux. <laughs> and so I look at my list and I start the process of elimination. And I realize that of all the possible things that might be mine, it's probably my predilection for wordplay. My love for the lightness of language and weight of words that has the most potential. I feel like I'm finally ready to embrace this idea that we should all have a single thing that we can get away with when I look over at my five-year-old and see that she is spitting into a fan so that it sprays back into her own face. She is spitting and giggling and then spitting some more. Surely a better parent would step in and stop this nonsense right here and right now. But I just sit back and watch her take such delight in the sensory pleasures of life and can't stop myself from thinking, that girl is my spitting image. <laughs> it's no time for puns. But what can I do? That's my thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm going to read one more. It's called, uh, somewhat depressingly, Why Write When There Are Thousands of People Out There Not Reading Your Work? <laughs> we were at the home of some friends when I found myself in a conversation with their six-year-old son. My dad told me that you're a writer, he said. I am, I said. Then let me ask you something, he said. How come I've never read anything you ever wrote? <laughs> That's a good question, I said. Think about it, he said. Right now, there are thousands of people out there who aren't reading any of your books. <laughs> That's a true quote, by the way. He shook his head and walked away, leaving me all alone in the kitchen. I grabbed a slice of lukewarm pizza and started laughing to myself. I'd recently published a small book of short prose and was well aware of all those people out there not reading it. It got me thinking about one of the two recurring dreams that I'd been having as of late, which involved me walking into a bookstore to give a reading and seeing that there was only one person in the audience. This, in fact, actually happened once. And although I laughed it off at the time, cracked some joke about the sound of one hand clapping, it was one of those moments that remind you of the fine line between humility and humiliating. <laughs> we left our friend's house shortly afterward, and although it was getting late, we decided to give our five-year-old a bath. Giving our five-year-old a bath is always a bit of a production. She likes to bring trays of Tupperware into the tub with her and pretend that she is the star of some warped Disney film. Look, I overheard her say at one point as I was walking by, I know that you think you killed my parents, but I have news for you. It is I who poisoned your parents. <laughs> then she started laughing, this evil, maniacal laugh. I have no idea what the premise of her story was, but I wasn't about to ask, because if she knew that I was eavesdropping, she would have immediately stopped the show. And as I stood in the hallway listening in, I started thinking about the other recurring dream that I've been having as of late. In this one, I'm taking a shower. And when I step out, I realize that there's a full crowd of people waiting for me to read. I walk up to the podium, and not only do I not have my book with me, but I'm not wearing any pants. I'd always assumed that this was simply the converse of the first dream. Rather than showing up with something to say and finding no one there, I show up with nothing to say and find everyone there. <laughs> but as I listened to my daughter play so freely in the bath, her imagination wandering in the most surprising and delightful of ways, I wondered if this dream was actually about the tension between the pleasures of writing 
and the pressures of being a writer. On my better days, I'm able to compartmentalize the two. But whenever I've sat down to write lately, I found myself worrying about book sales and Goodreads ratings, about the reviews that people were writing and the reviews that people weren't writing. My five-year-old was starting to sing some song that can only be described as a ballad to her bum. I couldn't make out all the lyrics, though, because she was laughing so hard as she belted it out. And I realized that if I wanted to reclaim the pleasures of writing, I couldn't worry about all those thousands of people not reading my books, because that's not why we write. We write for that single fleeting moment, as Mercy Cunningham says, when we feel alive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. That was funny and deep and thoughtful and all kinds of things all at once. Thank you for sharing with that with us. And his book is here, so I hope you will all buy a copy because you need all that in your life. Um, our second presenter is um, Lisa Davis, who is coming in lieu of Kathy Desjardins. Lisa is in um, one of Kathy's workshops and has brought a couple of some poems to write, and I'm gonna just turn it over to her, but I do want to read Kathy's um, bio, uh, because that is important, and we should know. Kathy Desjardins has written two books of poetry, uh, one called With Child, and another Buddha in the Garden. And by the way, these photos aren't just because it's April and the tulips are blooming, but actually those are from her garden. Uh, a former faculty member at Lesley University and UMass Boston, she has taught, poetry, uh, she has taught writing to all ages, from kindergartners to graduate students and seniors, and now teaches poetry workshops regularly at Grub Street Writers uh, and via home Zoom workshops. Her work has been published in many periodicals and journals, including Conoscenti, um, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Boston Globe Magazine, and she is a poet laureate, poet laureate emerita of Arlington. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Anjali said, I'm Lisa Davis, and I'm really pleased to be here uh, on behalf of Kathy. Uh, I got a call around 3.30 today, and um, we we're off to the races. Um, reincarnation is a big, and so I see many of my fellow workshop people here. It's a joy to see you and other people that I've known from other parts of town. Um, Kathy's, you know, very, uh, articulate about reincarnations. So I note in Kathy's um, lovely book with child that her name is Kathy Ann Veronica Slavinsky Slater Spence Desjardins. So there's been some changes in her life. Um, I will be following a sort of a script that Kathy gave me and um, we'll go, we'll do it. Um, Kathy often um, starts her workshops with a singing bowl, and um, I think I can get it to work. Um, so I invite you, as you hear the ringing of the bell, to just notice your breath, take in your breath, in and out. So Kathy is now, um, when she works in person, able to use her singing bowl. But for three years on Zoom, she also did the singing bowl. And after about a year, someone, and that someone was me, said, you know, when you do the singing bowl, we just hear a clunk. And she was kind of mortified. But she tells the story because she it became, she became aware of how generous and sweet the participants in the poetry workshop were about letting her continue on with this. And so when I heard this story, I said, well, Kathy, you know, that was me. She's like, I know. And I said, well, what does that say about me? And, and she said, well, you were, you were the reality that brought me out of the fantasy. And I thought, well, that doesn't seem so good. And she said, no. So then I was aware of the sweetness and love that, the, that students had for me. So I'm in the clear there. 
Um, and for her sensory object, she's asked me to pass around um, something that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, which is the Russian babushka doll. And um, she wants us to take attention to our previous incarnations are all within us somewhere. And so I'm going to pass this around, and you're free to play with it as you will, maybe keep it moving. But she's, the imperative is to please don't lose the baby. The baby is really sweet inside there, and she's devoted to the baby. So I'll give it to Charles. And, um, and, and that poetry enables us to hold on and revisit our different incantations in a way that we might, might possibly not. So I'm going to be reading five poems. The first two are from her book, um, With Child. The baby cries when they leave the room. They're torn out in the world. Separation wears thin. But so does carrying, carrying, carrying him. At night, they've taken to creeping from his room on all fours. If desire could create a ghost devil, they'd leave a doppelganger standing by his crib. They buy tapes of lullabies, and soon he leaves to drift away on that ocean of sound. Coming in to stop the loop of music, they've snared by the songs. Why is every lullaby so sad? Lilting songs of treasures, small pleasures, our mind shafts to caves of regret as if we'd swallowed a stone of sorrow. Nights, one parent or the other can be found weeping, hand hovering over the stop button by the glow of the nightlight. They look at the angel face, lashes drooping on cheeks of the child they've taught to sleep apart from them. And this poem is called No Turn Away. Thump, thump of feet. My head pops a signal to come to my side of the bed. Your father would take you back. Too crowded, he thinks. But I turn sideways, making a hollow. I can't resist your warmth, your ears like small, intricate animals. Although our arms and legs become a problem, mine going to sleep under you, yours poking into me, no more sleep. Soon we'll have to stop this skin to skin. I'll wear nightgowns so I won't scar you by what I am. It gets harder than taking on false modesty. I'll learn to ignore or not your shame at my singing and what I have to say. I'll work on learning not to let you matter so much. But now from this locus of known warmth, I vow that as best I can, I'll always take you in as you will let me. And uh, the next poems are from her book, Buddha in the Garden. And um, it's not lost on us that Desjardins, you know, means of the garden. Buddha is where you find him. I found mine at Pool City on Route 1 near Saugus, among the bird baths and inflatable floating chairs with twin cup holders. He's the standard concrete model with pin curls, a top knot, a Mona Lisa smile. Brought up Catholic, I talked to him as if he were a saint, someone who might intervene on my behalf. Buddha, I say, the weeds are winning, overtaking the garden. What can I do? Or Buddha, no one sees my garden. The showy lilies, the new dahlias, I call bordello fire and sunset feathers. The children are grown, the grandchildren don't visit. Should I post pictures of my flowers on Facebook? Do I need to get on Instagram? Names, in spring, calm among bright blossoms Buddha. In summer, overgrown by bearberry Buddha. In fall, leaf in lap Buddha. In winter, snow cone head Buddha. I circumnavigate Buddha, no mud, no lotus, I imagine him saying. 
The ground under him has settled, so he leans towards me, a little askew as I talk on the phone. My friend is worried about her adrenals. My grown children are seeking therapists in the changing healthcare market. I put them on speakerphone so I can rip out weeds with both hands, purslane, chickweed, twitch grass, hoping the neighbors won't overhear trauma drama. I assemble little heaps of weeds and find them days later, small piles of brittle branched paper. And this next phone is called That Blue, and Kathy says it is specifically about this time of year. One day after the eternal winter, the scylla gush out of the ground in a tide that lags at the sidewalk. Cold wind rakes them into ripples so they make a lake on the lawn. There is no color like this blue, shimmering with violet. It makes the sky seem pale. You can find it across centuries in beads, ribbons, velvet, concocted on the palettes of Gauguin and Van Gogh. It was favored by the Fauves, those wild beasts of art. The color makes you pause as if listening for music, as if you could make a wish on it for something you'd forgotten you wanted. And the last poem um, tonight is called EKG. And um, I said, you know, Kathy, can I say it's about you, know, you and your husband? She said, well, it's about us and everyone else we know. I said, OK. So EKG. We're together in the kitchen when you say you talk to your new doctor, the one who ordered up an EKG, because he said he'd heard a skip, a stutter. Most likely, it's within a normal range. What's normal in our undercover pumps? Part mystery fist, blossom, cage? Once I saw a tattooed heart clumped on a woman's bare back. Not a valentine, but a thick muscle and full spurt. Aortic wad inked in red and blue lines. She said she loved our corporeal hearts, the beauty in anatomy. Anyway, you tell me, my doctor scanned the blips and says I'm fine. Let's look, I say. So you hoist your shirt up from your hips. I place a palm curved to fit among your soft gray curly furs, spider fingers scurrying for a tidal beat. Why had I never sensed a miss when I so love to lie with you, nest my palm to feel the thump there? I touch it now, rueful with what I know, ways I thought I could protect, repair, mistaken but a new grasp of lovadub, all unnoticed, our deep rhythms change, and in what we claim as hub of love, imperfect is our normal range. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing those with us, and um, I hope you will convey to Kathy that people were listening intently and moved by those poems. Um, our last presenter is uh, Charles Coe. And I'm sitting up front here. Charles Coe is the author of four books of poetry. When he sent me the bio when we were planning this event, it was three books of poetry. But since then, his fourth has been published. Um, his latest is Purgatory Road, which just came out in March, uh, published by Leapfrog Press. His others are All Sins Forgiven, Poems for My Parents, Picnic on the Moon, and Memento Mori. He is also author of Spin Cycles, a novella published by Gemma Media. Charles was a 2017 artist in residence for the city of Boston, where he created an oral history project focused on residents of Mission Hill. He's an adjunct professor of English at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island, and at Bay Path University in Longmeadow, Massachusetts, where he teaches in both Master of Fine Arts writing programs. Please welcome Charles Coe. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for being here this evening. And uh, Lisa, thanks for that lovely reading of Kathy's work. And Ben, thanks for those uh, gut busters. <laughs> but well, that, that story about the guy um, asking you if he'd break you, I think we've all had that. 
But I had this guy at this party say to me, oh, so you're right, so have I read anything of yours? And I said, I took a sip of my beer and looked at him and said, well, I doubt it. <laughs> and, and he was a little taken aback. He, um, he didn't, he, he seemed to think that he was being insulted, but he didn't know exactly how. <laughs> and, and he was right on both counts. He was being insulted, and he didn't know exactly how. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm trying to give myself a little time right here so I uh, don't run my mouth incessantly. My, my sensory overload piece is going to be uh, this is a didgeridoo, it's a portable didgeridoo there. They're usually a, a, a stick, but this one has like an intestine. Um, so I'm going to play a little of this and then I'm going to do a, a short uh, song that I wrote called Black and Gold Blues, Black and Gold Blues, and I'm going to do it uh, a cappella, obviously, because the band's not here tonight. <laughs> Yeah. 
much, my breath. I guess I ain't had much time left. Oh, forgive me for my You have to say that lockdown style. I'm doing my official book launch on Saturday at the Friends Meeting House at 2 o'clock. So um, that's what I'll you know, go full front and read a whole bunch of stuff on it. So. But I'll just read a few now. This is Opportunity. A woman on a park bench stands talking to a friend while a little girl sitting behind her on the bench feeds an ice cream cone to the family dog. Dogs are noted opportunists where food is concerned, and this was no exception, making short work of the, the job at hand, or rather the job at tongue, while the woman's attention is elsewhere. Funny how our idea of what's important changes over time. When I am older and rarer, I won't remember today's headlines, the, the daily litany of abuses and atrocities. I won't remember the comings and goings of some flavor of the month celebrity. I'll remember the way the wind tossed dry leaves on a dry autumn afternoon. I'll remember a dog's tongue, resolute and efficient, and the little girl's conspiratorial smile. <laughs> uh, I grew up in um, Indianapolis, Indiana. Well, I'll, I'll read this one down. Read that. Uh, this is. You know, I changed my mind again. See, that's what you can do when you, you know, you, you, can do, you can do what you want. You can get your freak on. <laughs> This is, I wish I'd held my father's hand. My father put what he wanted to buy on the drugstore counter and said a polite good afternoon to the young white clerk who didn't return the greeting or meet his eye, just stared at the items as if father had dumped a bucket of kitchen scraps. And then with exquisite slowness, the drip contempt began to ring them up. It was an ordinary day in Indiana in the early 60s. Everywhere, black person was, they had to bite their tongue. Looking back over the years, I wish I could go back to that afternoon when my father stood quiet and still while that punk tried to put him in his place. I wish I could have caught his eye, delivered the silent message that I understood what he had to go through every day to keep the peace, to raise his family. I wish I'd held my father's hand. Uh, Massachusetts Bay Authority employee 
Werner Herzog <laughs> when asked why red line trains are running slow. <laughs> because the old gods lie moldering in their lonely graves, <laughs> while the grinning lords of chaos dance atop blood coated skies <sighs> on the smoking ruins of their new empire. Also, there is a disabled train in Parsi. <laughs> I was, uh, why? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what, what can you say? <laughs> Some of the things that you're writing about, you know, what do you, what do you say? Like this one, I was watching dishes one day, and this phrase, the title of the poem popped into my head, and I said, what? Uh, I guess I have to write a poem about that. And I was writing the poem, and I was sort of getting a little uh, kick, because we, we writers are really good at entertaining ourselves. <laughs> uh, but then as I got near the end of the poem, as often happens with creative work, I kind of went someplace I hadn't planned. I don't know how that happened. So this is butt dialing Jesus. <laughs> there was a time when voices emanating from my pants would have caused concern. <laughs> but now I simply shrugged and pulled out my phone to hear a recording. You have reached the Son of God. I am currently speaking with another supplicant, but please hold. Your salvation is important to me. <laughs> This was followed by music. I expected celestial choirs or maybe an elevator-friendly version of My Sweet Lord, but was instead treated to acoustic delta, acoustic delta with his guitar. Interrupted after a few minutes by the voice of himself, <laughs> greeting me by name and asking how he could serve. I was startled. I didn't expect to actually get through. <laughs> uh, what's the one true religion? I asked Bluster just to have something to say. All of them, he replied. None of them. I was taken aback. What? That's it? That's it, he said. Follow the golden rule. Leave the campground cleaner than you found it. Look, anything else? I have a lot of people on hold. <laughs> I had nothing, mumbled my thanks. He said, go in peace, and broke the connection. I put down the phone and stared out the window. The guy across the street was clearing snow off his sidewalk. Never really liked that dude. But I grabbed my shovel and go with the hand. <laughs> So I'll turn the truth about it. I will end with this uh, this one. And again, thanks to everybody for, for coming to hang out and for being totally cool people. <laughs> well, thank you for well, let's have a hand for independent book. Yeah. And if you want to buy a book, don't buy it from that company that starts with A, I not speak. Buy it from your independent bookstore. If they don't have it, they can order it for you. Okay, there's nothing that they can do for you that Amazon can do for you that, that your independent bookstore cannot. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you can give me my check later. Yeah. <laughs> you take Venmo? Uh, no, I take Confederate currency. Uh -oh. so, <laughs> actually, if you had some, that would be a lot. Talk. Bitcoin, I don't take Bitcoin. <laughs> Cowrie shells. Um, so this is flight interrupted. The setting is the Porter Square uh, T stop. But we all know that. Flight interrupted. Last night at a subway station, I'm the only one getting off. No one's getting on. And I stand a long moment watching the train disappear down the tunnel. A solitary pigeon has somehow managed to navigate three levels from the street down to the platform and is walking 
back and forth along the tiles, cooing, head by. Spooked by my nearness, it flies to the ceiling, flutters along the solid barrier, and finding no path to familiar sky, returns to pace the platform a little farther down. I make my way to the escalator, looking for an employee to tell, but there's nobody there. There's never anybody there at night anymore. And as I reach the street and step into the cool air, my poet brain instantly chugs into motion. The machinery of metaphor rattles and cranks, hissing steam, spitting images as I consider this bird's plight. But as Freud might have said, this isn't a metaphor, it's a pigeon. <laughs> a living, breathing creature with a beating heart like mine, trapped in a place that neither belongs nor understands. No, but the seed of a poem has already taken root. I'm already comparing this pigeon's dilemma to every creature constrained and bewildered by whatever invisible ceilings keep us from taking flight. All right, let's see what it is. This is the quote that was taken out of the Ben, what was it? Ben Boozled. Ben Boozled, okay. Creative people combine playfulness and discipline or responsibility and irresponsibility. There's no question that a playfully light attitude is typical of creative individuals. But this playfulness doesn't go very far without its antithesis, a quality of doggedness, endurance, and perseverance. This is clearly your five-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the last name here. Thank you, can you say that again? Okay, that was the author of this quote. Well, thank you. Every time we have a salon, I think the next one can't be as good, and then it's even better. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming out. And uh, thank you to our three presenters and authors. Please come up front, buy some books, ask the authors to sign them. Um, as a writer, there's no greater pleasure than signing your name in your book and having some and putting it in someone's hands. So, um, and we all need more poetry in our lives all the time. Uh, so thanks again, and uh, thanks again, Emily and Kickstand. Thank you.